wonderful responsibility, and that is to introduce uh, or someone that we all know. He's come into our homes um, and interpreted the world uh, for us for decades. And you may remember hearing Larry Tubb a, a day or so ago mention um, Tom Brokaw. Uh, it is in f a fact that part of the reason that we're here today is because of Tom. Tom Brokaw came into the lives of Mark and Shauna Tree, uh, who were lead investors in the Renaissance development property that we all visited. And they were, like many of us, multitasking, driving and listening um, to an audio book. And that book that they were listening to was Tom's, The Time of Our Lives, A Conversation About America. And in that book there is a discussion about purpose-built communities. And though they were very much engaged in their community, they were interested in making it the best community that it could be, all of a sudden a light bulb went off. Correct me if I'm wrong, that maybe there was something else that was possible in Fort Worth, and Tom was interpreting the news of the day. And we are all here uh, some years later, uh, because of that connection, because Tom has the credibility, the experience, and also took the opportunity to tell stories that resonate with people and make them not just listen, because listening is important, but really act. Take a different course. Consider a different set of opportunities, see a set of challenges, and also see a new set of solutions. So, first of all, we need to thank Mark and Shauna, don't you think? Somehow or another, we got connected. I got an email. I met them, they met Carol, and the um, we were off to exploring how we might help from Atlanta and from Purpose Built uh, right here in Fort Worth. But none of that would have happened without Tom Brokaw. We know him because he's reported on matters all over the world. But then he's come into our, our lives in a very special way uh, and helped us figure out how to connect resources to breaking the cycle of poverty right here in Fort Worth. Please join me in welcoming our very own good friend from news, Tom Brokaw. Thank you. you want to come down? I was going to help you up. You're going to help me down. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Shirley. Not this one. I don't know how to use microphones, so they're going to help me out here. <laughs> Madam Mayor, thank you very much. And congratulations to all of you for your involvement in what I think is one of the very best community organizations in America today from the ground up. I, um, I like coming to Fort Worth, Texas. I have a lot of memories of Fort Worth. <laughs> Uh, my great friend, Bob Schieffer of CBS News, is a graduate of TCU. And they named the journalism school after him. And so a lot of us came down for that. Jim Lehrer and Tom Friedman and me and others. And I stood up and said, we really don't know Bob Schieffer. We were rented to show up at this <laughs> and say what a wonderful guy he was. But if you name the journalism school after him, Good luck in the future. And then, of course, I spent a night at Billy Bob's in Fort Worth. 
I don't remember much about that <laughs> night, I must tell you. But it was the distinctive difference between Dallas and Fort Worth, obviously. And the connection back to Dallas, I sobered up all the way on the car <laughs> as I was driving there. Uh, the title of my speech, A Lucky Life Interrupted, is taken from a book that recounts my experience with cancer. I was diagnosed in the fall of 2013 after an exceptionally lucky life. Personally married one of the greatest women in the world anywhere, been married for 53 years now, and have this wonderful family. I realized all my professional uh, dreams, and everything had gone well until I got diagnosed with cancer. And it was an ordeal, much greater than I thought that it was going to be. But I'm in good form. The cancer's in remission. I'm dealing with the other parts of it. And it has had a profound effect on my life in this way. It's made me stop and think about what is really important to me in the time that I have left, how I want to spend my time personally, and the kind of message that I want to convey. And so when Tom Cousins called me and asked me if I could come to this meeting, I immediately said yes, because I am such an admirer of Tom and Ann first, and of course the work of purpose-built communities. So I'd like to share with you, if I can, for just a few moments, my life in journalism and what I've learned from it, my personal life and what I've learned from that, and the relationships that I've developed over the years. I've been thinking a lot recently about my own life. I was born in 1940, before World War II started. I'm an old dude. I'm 75, I'm going to be 76 in February. And I thought about the big ideas that really shaped my life. First one, I was unaware of it at the time because I was just an infant, was how we prepared as a country to get involved in World War II. The future of the planet was at stake. And yet in 1939, the United States was the 16th military power in the world. Poland had a greater military than we did. Dwight Eisenhower was a colonel in 1938, never heard a shot fired in anger. 1944, he was commanding the greatest military invasion in the history of mankind. We fought that war. Six of the seven continents, all the seas and the skies above, and we prevailed. 1944, the war looks like it's going to end successfully for us. The country is in deep, deep debt because we've shifted everything to military armaments. We didn't have an industry that was designed really to take care of those folks at home. But the Congress, Democrats and Republicans alike, did something really exceptional. The next big idea was the GI Bill. The GI Bill would pay for college and for technical training for all those veterans who were coming home to rebuild America after first the Depression and then the war. It transformed this country. Generations of engineers and lawyers and physicians and school teachers and people who could fix your furnace or do your plumbing were trained because of the GI Bill. That was a big, big idea. And it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy because someone had to pay for it. And those institutions had to be created that would train them to create the greatest domestic economy mankind had ever seen, the industrial might of the United States. I was a beneficiary. My dad was forced by his family to drop out of school in the third grade. He was effectively abandoned in the northern plains of South Dakota until he was taken in by a Swedish homesteader who taught him how to drive a team of horses and how to drill a well. And then he translated all of that later into heavy machinery and was a genius at operating construction equipment. If it had a motor, he could drive it. If it was broken, he could fix it. But the best thing he did was marry my mother, who graduated from high school as a prodigy at 16 and wanted desperately to go to college, but it cost $100 a year. There was no way that her family could afford that. They had lost everything in the Depression. But the two of them had the American dream of raising a family, and maybe one of their children could go to college. And of course, as the firstborn, I have the first crack at that. And in the 1950s came along, my dad could get good work on big projects in the Midwest. 
building dams on the Missouri River and building highways and bridges. My mother worked in the post office. She was kind of the managing editor of town. She wanted to be a journalist because she couldn't go to college. She just assumed that role when she was working in small town, news, in small town post offices. Come home every night and share with me what had ever happened. So I was kind of on that fast track to what I thought would be the good life. And it paid off for me. I did work hard. It wasn't easy. But on the 40th anniversary of D-Day, I had a transformative experience. I went to Normandy thinking, I'm going to be in the north of France. I'm going to have a lot of great meals of seafood. I'm a, I was training for a marathon. I'll be running through the beautiful hills till I walked on that beach. And I met men who came from experiences and backgrounds just like my parents, who'd waded ashore that day, the greatest invasion ever to begin to liberate Europe from the desperate clutches of Adolf Hitler. And as I looked at them, I realized they looked like my school teachers and the businessmen on Main Street and their wives were off to the side with plastic covers over their fresh hairdos clutching their purses and they looked like my mother and my school teachers and my Sunday school teachers. And I thought, my God, what have we been missing in this country? And I began to collect stories like those men and their wives. And that became The Greatest Generation, the book that I wrote about how much we owed that generation. And in many ways, that had an enormous impact on the baby boomers who were born after the war. And their first thoughts were, I'm going to reject everything that my parents stood for. <laughs> a nuclear family, stay married through a thick and thin. You believe in the institutions. You believe in your government. You answer the call to duty. They rejected all of that until they, too, began to be adults and raise their own children <laughs> and began to think about what kind of a country they wanted for them. And then when I wrote the book, they read what their parents had gone through, and it was like a revelation to them. Some of the most touching stories have come especially for women. Because women, understandably, wanted to take a new place in this new world. They more than deserved it. But their fathers had grown up in the military environment and had a much more rigid view of the place of women. And so there was a lot of clashing that went on. But now women come up to me in their late 40s and 50s, tears in their eyes, and say, I didn't understand my dad until I read your book. I now realize what he went through and the horrors that he had to experience before he could come home. And I'm going to be a better person for having read that. These were all tough, hard experiences for those people. Well, after the war, more big ideas. John F. Kennedy was the first World War II veteran to be elected president of the United States. And one of the first things he did was to say to the Russians, watch this. We're going to go to the moon before this decade is out. That unleashed this enormous tsunami of technology and engineering and scientific advancement in every field possible. And not too far from the mayor's home city of Atlanta, in Montgomery, Alabama, one of the native sons of her town was getting attention in this country as the diminutive but powerful voice of something called the Civil Rights Movement. Because African American men who had served honorably and courageously in the war, despite the desperate attempts in so many instances to belittle their capabilities, came home and said, we shall not be second class citizens in our own home. And when I would say to them, these veterans, how did you put up with it? Why would you put up with that kind of demeaning treatment? They'd swell up their chest and say to me, because it's my country, my country. And I wanted to have a stake in it and make it as great as I knew that it could be. And Dr. King had two premises for his movement. First of all, it would be nonviolent. I cannot tell you how many times in godforsaken places in the rural south and even in the big cities. I watched in horror, but also with utter admiration, young demonstrators go down into the fetal position as uniformed cops and rednecks would beat on them. And as soon as they faded away, they'd get up and march again. 
And the other thing that Dr. King believed in was the rule of law, that eventually the rule of law would liberate his people and this would be a better country for it. We have not worked our way through all the racial divides, quite obviously, in this country. But that was the hard start. It was really a difficult, difficult time. The extraordinary courage that was shown, not just by the demonstrators, but by the leaders as well, and by those who stood beside them. That was a hard, hard achievement of a very big idea. Now, Richard Nixon had a number of bad big ideas. <laughs> But he had a great big idea, and he went against the grain of his own party to say that we're going to open relations with China. At that point, they had 800 million people, and Mao was still alive. But he said it's a 2,000-year-old civilization. They're only going to get bigger, and eventually Mao will die, and they will take their place on this planet in a very demonstrable way. And it will put the Russians on notice that we have a relationship with China. That was a hard, big idea, a decision for him to make. Ronald Reagan came to office, determined to take down the Soviet Union by military means, if necessary. But others in his circle, including his wife Nancy, persuaded him that things were beginning to change in Moscow. And there was a way to have a relationship with the Soviet Union that wouldn't require shots being fired or, God forbid, a nuclear war being started. And he saw that. A big idea and a hard one in his political circles. But he got the job done. The 1960s were uneven in a lot of ways. A lot of bad big ideas came out of the 60s. But the big, big idea that came out of the 60s was the idea of greater tolerance in America for different kinds of people, and especially Tolerance for the place of women in our society. The mayor is a perfect example of that. When I lived in Atlanta in the mid-1960s, it was known as the city too busy to hate. But on the most prominent television station in town, the one in which I worked, I was a 25-year-old Yankee white boy who had the most prominent job on that station. We had no African-American employees on the air. There were no African-American members of the city council when I moved there. One member of the state legislature, Leroy Johnson, was in the state senate. The transformation of these urban areas, and especially the opportunities that were open for women, was transformative. I honestly believe that at the end of this century, historians will look back and say, that was the century of women. That's when the gender finally had its opportunity to create any opportunity that it wanted to and take its place besides all the males in any occupation you can imagine. Warren Buffett, who is one of the underwriters of purpose-built communities, says, if we've done this well with half the brain power, think of how well we're going to do with twice the brain power. <laughs> Such a Warren Buffett line, but it's absolutely true. So that was a big idea. What's the next big idea? Well, a bunch of kind of wonky guys who are mostly known for their chess skills and not being able to get a date for the junior prom <laughs> were out in the Northwest and in Silicon Valley creating the most transformative technology any person has ever seen, and we're just at the beginning of it. The digital age. It has changed how we do everything, how we communicate and socialize, how we consume, how we sell, how we do research. That was a big idea. What's the underpinning of that? Be disruptive. Find a new way to do the old things that need to get done. It wasn't hard. It wasn't easy. It was hard. But they stuck with it. And we were all kind of looking off to the side saying, what are they up to anyway? Now, there's no one in this room without an instrument in their pocket who won't spend part of the day communicating, telephoning, and doing everything else, and being sold something that, as Tim McCook says, the head of Apple, you don't know you need it until we produce it. <laughs> that was a big idea. Tom Cousins had a big idea. 
That's a big, big American idea. Purpose-built communities. But here is the essential truth that we all in this room have to realize. It's hard. It's really, really hard. It takes all of our mental stamina and our physical stamina and our financial generosity to transform these communities. Tom saw that. One of his favorite lines to me, in my judgment, was that I said, what was it like at the beginning? Because I knew he'd been a big, great, and very, very generous citizen in Atlanta. He said, I would go around to the president of Georgia and other friends of mine, including our common friend, Ted Turner, tell them what I was going to do. And they'd say, that's crazy. You're going to lose a lot of money. And he finally started looking at him and saying, I lost a lot of money on your crazy ideas. I'm going to lose a lot of money on my crazy idea for a change. <laughs> but what Tom realizes, and everyone in this room realizes, it's hard. Transforming America is difficult. But this is a transformative country. There has never, ever been, and probably never will be again, the kind of country that was created by our forefathers and mothers on this extraordinary piece of geography known as the North American continent. The rule of law, the constitution that still lives today, representative government, the ability of people to come from all over the world as they have. We're all immigrants in this room, all of us and build what we have today. So I was coming in today on the landing pattern into Dallas. I was looking out at the housing developments uh, as you drive, as you fly between Dallas and Fort Worth, just the housing developments alone. To say nothing of the granaries and the big factories and the other things that are going on, I had, I'm all over the world all the time. I never see this kind of mature development that has a real stability and a foundation attached to it but it was hard to get that done, given all the cycles of the economy and our place in the world. So my very strong feeling is, the days that I'll have left, and there are gonna be a lot of them, I'm gonna spend my time dedicating myself as a journalist and as a citizen to projects that have a desperate need for people to do the hard work. And that's what you're doing. You're doing the hard work here. And you can't make a commitment to purpose-built communities without acknowledging that fundamental fact. And by the way, that hard work has to be done on all the layers of the enterprise in which you're involved. The residents of the neighborhoods that you're transforming, the success of the people who come from those neighborhoods, those of us from the outside, can't be just one benefit dinner a year, write a little check, and then leave. It really has to be learn a lesson from the last experience and apply it to the next one. And that's how we'll change this country. Now, you're meeting here today in a way that is so reaffirming to me because we're in the middle of a presidential election campaign. We're not quite in the middle of it yet, but it seems like it. <laughs> we're ramping up toward game time, beginning the first of the year. And what do we hear? We don't hear great, new, big ideas. We hear the denigration of America. We hear from the most prominent Republican candidate that we're not a great nation anymore, but he'll make it great again. <laughs> we hear on the Democratic side a lot of hand-wringing and a lot of complaining and a lot of division on the Democratic side about what they can do. What you're missing in all of this debate across all party lines is the willingness of a candidate to look into the camera and say, we are a great nation, but we're going to need to be greater to solve our domestic problems and the divisions that exist here, and to find and keep our leadership role in a more divided world in which the competition is greater than it has ever been in the lifetime of any of us. But we can do that because this is a country of big ideas. 
big ideas that pay off, and it's the citizenship that is willing to step forward and get the job done, and I want to lead a country like that. That's what I think everyone in this room would like to hear from Republicans or Democrats or Tea Party members alike, rather than looking at this country through the wrong end of the telescope and seeing only the smallness of their views. I'd like to see larger views than all of that. So I come to you really as a pilgrim from journalism, as an admirer of what you're doing, with the hope that you will continue to do it, because in my 75 years of living in this country and being rewarded as a citizen who came out of the hard, hard clay and the prairie of northern South Dakota with parents who found their way by doing the hard thing and the right thing, I have had the privilege of being invited to rooms like this and associating with people like Tom and Ann Cousins. That's maybe in so many ways, beyond my family, my greatest reward. So I wanted to come here today and encourage you to stay the course, as hard as it is, and hope that each of you will go out and find two or three other people who can be brought in to this great enterprise and find a way through it. It's not seasonal. This is a lifetime of work ahead of us, but it can be done. And finally, I'd like to leave you with the canniness of members of the greatest generation that I've encountered over the years. One of my very favorite members was a man by the name of Lefty Cray, still with us, 90-year-old fly fisherman, the legendary fly fisherman of that sport, Ted Williams' favorite fishing companion. Lefty was in the 69th Division, went across Northern Europe, ended up in the Battle of the Bulge, and then had a union with the uh, Russians at the Elba River. And we've spent a lot of time in a boat, but I've known over the years not to ask these veterans pointed questions about what they went through, because it's too hard for them in too many instances. Lefty's a really gregarious guy, but I approached him gingerly, and I said, do you want to talk about the Battle of the Bulge? And he said, I really don't. But I've been waiting to tell you a story. He said, we had two good old boys from Georgia in our outfit. They weren't cousins, but they might as well have been. He said, there were seventh grade dropouts. They could run through the night, see things that the rest of us couldn't see. They were crack shots. We're sitting in the barracks, getting ready to go in the Battle of the Bulge. We know that the Germans are outnumbering us 200,000 to 80,000. We don't think we're going to survive, any of us. One of these good old boys says aloud to the other good old boys, you get yourself into that life insurance we're supposed to buy. <laughs> the other good old boy said, I did. I bought me $5,000 worth of life insurance. How much did you get? And the other good old boy said, I bought me $10,000 worth of life insurance. $5,000 guy says, dummy, why would you do that? You're not going to be around to enjoy it. <laughs> and the 10,000 guy said, you're the dummy. Who do you think they're going to put on the front lines? The guy they have to pay 5000 to or the guy they have to pay 10000 <laughs> Thank you all very much. I'd love to take some questions from you. I have a couple of recent examples of the kind of work that is going on that you're doing as well. And if I can help in any way carry this message forth, I'm here to do just that. I will uh, take just a moment and just share with you the uh, kind of schedule that I've been on recently. Um, I'm still working at NBC. I've got a lot of big projects. We're meeting on it on, on a daily basis. I live in New York. I have a ranch in Montana where I'm headed this afternoon. My dog's upstairs in the hotel room, probably ordering room service, a big steak of some kind, <laughs> going bird hunting. Um, but as I said at the outset, I'm trying to to stay as involved as best I can with the enterprises that mean a lot to me. I'm going to just tell you about two of them that I've been with in the last two weeks. Last night, as I do every year, I was the MC at something called uh, the Bonacani Project. 
the Miami Project. Dick Bonacani is an all-pro uh, linebacker for the Miami Dolphins, all-American at Notre Dame, the man who will not take no for an answer in anything that he does. His son, Mark, at age 19, playing in a football game, made a big hit and was paralyzed from the neck down. And Nick said to him, when they first communicate, we're going to find a way to cure spinal paralysis. That was 30 years ago. The foundation has made exceptional strides. They're doing really the cutting edge global work on dealing with spinal cord injuries, with the steroids and other treatments right away. And they're getting closer than I ever thought it was possible. Now you talk about hard work. That room was filled at the Waldorf with a lot of guys from Wall Street who were writing big checks because first they're moved by the people they see and secondly because we always honor big time athletes. Last night it was Carl Malone and uh, John Stockton from the, uh, from, from, uh, from the Salt Lake City uh, NBA franchise. Stockton to Malone was a great call in the NBA. And Michelle Kwan was honored last night as well, Jennifer Capriotti. But you look out in the room and you see these young people, most of them daredevils, and that's how they get in trouble in wheelchairs for the rest of their life. But they know they live in a community that Nick has created in which hope has not disappeared for them. That's hard work. Last week, I presided at a dinner organized by a very attractive mother and father who lost a son in Afghanistan, their only son, three daughters, one son, star athlete at Duke, uh, honor scholar, and he was an Army Ranger, which is the toughest assignment that you can have. And he was killed in a firefight. So they immediately turned and said, we're going to do something to remember him. And they've created the Ranger Foundation called Lead the Way because that's always been the battle call of the Army Rangers. Rangers, lead the way. It came on the day of D-Day, when the Rangers were the boys of Punt de Hawk, who went up that murderous cliff to take out the big guns. And their commanding officer, General Cota, came ashore on the beach and barked, where are the Rangers? And they said, sir, they're all ready, up over the hilltop and over the cliff. And he said, Rangers, lead the way. That's become the battle call. So as I sat in that room and I looked out across it, we had probably two dozen Army Rangers, all of them wounded to one degree or another, some of them grievously, missing an eye and an arm, some of them unable to talk because they'd been so badly damaged in a cerebral fashion. Every one of them, when you talk to them, would say, sir, I'd just like to rejoin my outfit. These rangers and all the other people in military uniform represent less than 1% of our population. And they're taking 100% of the hits. The emotional hits, the physical hits, they're coming home missing limbs, they're coming home badly damaged psychologically, or they're coming home in body bags. That's immoral for a democratic society, in my judgment. So that's one of the things that I'm also paying a lot of attention to is how we can all move forward together. It's all in. In this case, it was Rangers lead the way, but that room was filled with people who walked out of that, not, that night saying, I think I need to do more for my country than just make a lot of money, which I believe is true. So do we have any questions? Yes, sir. Which story did you cover that affected you the most? Uh, the question is, what story did I cover that affected me the most? I, I, I get that a fair amount, as you might expect. Uh, and it's kind of a three-part answer. When I was a younger reporter, it was the Civil Rights Movement. I was so moved by the courage that I saw. And I had always been, growing up in mostly white bread South Dakota, uh, very sensitive about race. My dad, who I described earlier as having a very difficult time, identified a lot with people of color because he felt discriminated against. He had learning disabilities and he was thrown out by his family at an early age. So we were, the family on the, on the block was only for Joe Lewis, only for Jackie Robinson, and only for the people who were breaking through Jesse Owen. 
And then I began to realize in my career that if my pigmentation had been one shade darker, I wouldn't have gotten the first job in Omaha. I wouldn't have gotten the job in Atlanta. I wouldn't have gotten the job with NBC in Los Angeles. I really began to understand what it was like to be a young person in another shade of skin. And I watched those people claim their place with such courage. We were talking earlier about Julian Bond, who I got to know during those days. But now looking back, the two big stories of my lifetime, 9-11 was the single hardest time I've ever had as a journalist. I got thrown on the air at 9.30 in the morning, I was thinking it was a small plane that had hit the World Trade Center and then realized quickly that we were under assault. And most of the time in journalism, you have a sense that something big is going to happen. You know, when a war is going to break out, you know, the preparations are underway. You can see the hurricanes coming on all the weather maps, uh, and you know the political developments. So you have time to prepare. We had no time to prepare. We didn't know what was going to happen in the next nanosecond. And I very quickly said to my colleagues, no speculation. We just deal with what we know as best we can. And I had the advantage of being with a first-class crew. I was on with Matt and Katie and Tim Russell in Washington. And after the second tower went down, I looked into the camera and intuitively said, this will change us. We're at war. This is a declaration of war on America. And we'll have to respond to that. A lot of people said to me later, how much did you think about that? I mean, this is a bold statement. I said, I didn't think about it. It took everything I knew as a journalist and as a citizen and as a father and, a, and as a man to kind of intuitively understand this is where we're going. This is war. And the next week, obviously, was very, very difficult in every conceivable sense of the word. So that was the single toughest day of my life. The big, big stories, however, of my journalistic career are still underway. The collapse of the Soviet Union as a communist empire. Historians will be writing that for a thousand years. We don't know how that's going to play out. Putin obviously has different designs than Mikhail Gorbachev did. And the transformation of China, this 2,000-year-old civilization, from being just a large blank place on a map that we didn't know anything about under the tutelage of Chairman Mao, to now the most dynamic economy in so many ways in the world. But remember, there are that many people there, a billion, 300 million. And the challenges for the leadership to retain political control and at the same time develop an economy that keeps everybody happy could not be more daunting. Just one statistic, in the next 10 years, China will try to move 100 million people, mostly out of the West and the primitive rural areas, into cities. Those 100 million people will all want homes, cars, jobs, and all the tools of the digital age. How you pull that off as a controlled economy run by political figures who don't have a long ramp up to that. So there's a lot of concern right now that Chairman Xi, who is the new one, is more Mao than he is Deng Xiaoping, that he wants to get more control of the country politically, and he's rooting out the corruption that happened, understandably, in a hurry. These are big, big plays in our time. And at the same time, I kind of think in my own journalistic historian way, it's a privilege to be alive to see it. I'm fascinated by it. I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time hearing you. What, what are you hoping to impart to your grandchildren? My grandchildren? Well, I have, of course, I have the smartest grandchildren in the world. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's very interesting to me. The one who is kind of cognizant now of where she is and where she's likely to be going, we have grandchildren from 18 down to two and a half. The 18 year old's a freshman at Columbia this year. She's a San Francisco hipster. She's very sophisticated. She's traveled the world. She grew up in San Francisco. Her parents are both physicians. You know, she has, she has access, I suppose, to learning and understanding that I didn't get until I was 50, or as one of my friends, not until you were 60, broke out, did you talk like your granddaughter? Um, 
I think she thinks that this is a great opportunity for a young woman, that she is socially interested in social justice. My guess is she may end up in law school and that she'll be working on the areas of social justice and that we, because it's a long curve problem that we have about dealing with what you're all dealing with here as well. Um, and what we don't know is the ultimate effect of the digital age. It really is so transformative when you stop and think about it. Uh, look how the impact that it's having on politics, good and bad. Uh, here's the bad part. A lot of what you see in politics these days is driven by social media, by uh, websites, everything from the left all the way across to the right. Uh, we have a wonderful woman who works for us in Montana. They came out there because they really wanted to run a ranch and that was the life that they wanted. They didn't want to pay attention to a lot of the other things. But Karen, a couple times a week during the summer, we'll come across the bridge that separates the ranch over a river and she'll be wide-eyed and she'll say, you're not gonna believe what I read on the internet this morning. <laughs> My answer is always the same. I'm not gonna believe what you read on the internet this morning. There's a lot of uh, vicious uh, kind of propaganda that gets out there. And you don't catch up to it. And it's there for a long, long time. That's a big, big issue, I think. I think it's transformed American politics more than anything else social media has. So what I, what I worry about is the uh, is that there will not be people who will learn how to control it and that we will not have enough of a dialogue about it. We don't talk about it very much. You know, we're all kind of so bedazzled by it that we just, um, that we just watch and say, well, how do I get that app kind of thing. And a perfect example is I do radio commentary every day. So I was, before I came down here, I was in my hotel room, had my smartphone, and I had my iPad. I wrote my commentary on my iPad. Dial up on my smartphone, not a phone call but I just went online on, on the phone apps and recorded that and it was uplifted to New York and then went out to 400 radio stations across America. I didn't pick up a phone, didn't dial anything. It, just, it was just an upload. That's just a tiny example of the power of it. So I think that they will use this uh, in ways that I hope will be constructive and not just entertainment. Or Renee, yeah. Renee, why don't you go first? Yeah, I, I was going to say, as divided as our politics are, I think journalism has equally become divided. And so, and, and with the digital, digital age, what do you see as the future of journalism? And where are the next Tom Brokaws and that type of thing? Because we will never get focus if we remain as divided as we are. Yeah, I, I hear that a lot. I mean, there's two parts to the question. Uh, what happened to my generation of journalists and uh, what's happened to journalism, period. I'm going to surprise you with my answer. I actually think that we have more great journalism than anybody in this room realizes. But you cannot be a couch potato. You can't just sit back and take whatever comes off the screen or off your iPhone or off your, off your uh, laptop. I get up in the morning, I have a friend who is the editor of the Financial Times of London, one of the great newspapers in the world. Because of this new technology, keystroke, I'm reading his editorials and what he has to say and their analysis of what's going on in Europe and the Middle East. Same time, I've been gone from my hometown for 40 years, but I still have friends over there. Click, how's the football team doing this fall? I can read that and what's going on. I can go online to the Council of Foreign Relations overnight website keeping you up to date on what's happening with ISIS in the Middle East. I can go to any number of other websites that are very sophisticated and run by extraordinarily gifted people talking about, for example, what China is doing militarily in the South China Sea. And it's a big, big issue that doesn't get a lot of mainstream attention. So what I say to every audience is don't be a couch potato. Find those sites that you can count on that have credibility. You may not always agree with them, but if they're run by the right kind of, uh, and not just empowered people, but people with real credentials, you'll be a lot better off for it. As far as journalists are concerned, uh, it's a little hard now because what happened with my generation is there were fewer of us and therefore we got more attention. And there was a time when, as I have often said to audiences like this, 
almost all the news that you got on broadcast journalism, and even from Time Magazine and Newsweek and the New York Times, was through the prism of white middle-aged men who had been raised and educated on the eastern seaboard. That was okay by me, because I was going to be one of them one day. <laughs> but that's not true anymore. Now we have a much different mosaic making these decisions about what's important and what the roots of the story are and where it's going. Uh, we've got a terrific group of young people who work for us now. I watch them very carefully. I do a briefing at the beginning. They're generally ahead of me. And uh, then I watch them go out there and do the work that needs to get done. You know, this is not just an advertisement for our good people, but we have a guy in the Middle East by the name of Richard Engel that some of you may have seen on the air. He graduated from Stanford. He said to his dad, I want to be a foreign correspondent, but I'm going to have to do this on my own. I need a $10,000 loan. His dad gave it to him. He moved to Cairo. He learned Arabic on the streets. Then he moved to Israel because he thought that's where the next action would be. And then he got himself into Iraq when the war began, and he was a freelancer on his own. We worry about him a lot because he's so daring in where he goes and how he does it. And he's like my his father and I share him as a son. And he's in one ear, I'm in the other ear saying, Richard, back off a little bit. He was captured, as you may be aware of, uh, not so long ago. And he got out of it OK. And now he's a father. He's just had a child. He is as good a foreign correspondent as I have seen in my lifetime. In fact, better than most of the foreign correspondents that I grew up with, because he worked so hard at knowing the culture from the ground up. He just doesn't float in and get a briefing from the ambassador and then pontificate. He's a working, working reporter. Now, that's at NBC. The other networks all have that as well. Um, I watched Al Jazeera, which is a gutter-backed uh, uh, television network, uh, in part because they do a lot of international reporting that the, the American networks do not. They do a lot of stuff out of China, and they use newspaper columnists who are well-known on the air. So if you click around, you can find some exceptional reporting that goes on. And then certainly you will develop your own websites, the places that you want to go where they have kind of analysis of uh, what's happening. There's a wonderful thing called Politico, some of you may know about it. It's kind of the spreadsheet for politics overnight. Here's what happened, here's what the gossip is. It doesn't have a view one way or the other. And then of course you have Fox News on one side, MSNBC and commentary on the other. I'll just tell you one quick story over the years. I've known Bill Riley a long time, and I always uh, refuse to rise to his bait. He'll take me on on the air about something I've said or something I've done, and uh, he just kind of waits for me to try to come back at him. I'm not going to do it. I don't want to feed him that. So at this event last night, uh, Bill showed up, it turned out, uh, and they said, he'd like to have his picture taken with you. I said, you kidding? Bill Riley wants to have his picture taken with me? <laughs> And they said, yeah. So he came over and he sat down. And I said, so what's this all about? And he said, well, we're all getting older. And I said, no, I think the picture of the two of us is what they used to call in the arms race, mutual assured destruction. <laughs> Your people and my people going after each other. And when that picture gets out and he laughed, he said, yeah, I think that's probably what it's all about. So you just have to work harder as a consumer, as you do at everything else. I often say to audiences like this, Spend as much time determining where you're going to get your news as you do buying a flat screen television set or a new pair of running shoes um, or deciding what movie you want to go to. If you do that with news, you're going to be OK. I've got time for like one more, I think, and then I've got to head off over, over here. Yeah, hi. Uh, my name's Doug Judy, <clears throat> and I want to thank you very much for uh, speaking today. It's really uh, fascinating to actually hear your voice. My parents are just a couple years younger than you, and so your voice has been part of my life like probably a lot of us here for a long time, so I just want to thank you for that. <clears throat> I'm a doctor, a pediatrician, and a uh, public health professor, <clears throat> and the reason I'm here at Purpose Built Communities is because I really believe the work of this organization and of everybody here fundamentally has the potential to deal with a lot of the health issues that are facing uh, the most vulnerable populations in this country. But what's striking is how little this work is known within the medical, pro medical system or the public health system. And so my question for you as a journalist is whether you have any ideas of why this work is so unknown outside those of us who are doing it. 
and what it is within the media that we can do to make sure the stories that you hear here are actually known more broadly so the credit is given where it's due. I'm not sure I got the last part of that. Why? What we can do to make sure that the work of this group is getting out and getting recognized and known. The work of? A purpose, a, a purpose built, built, yeah. yeah. Like, um, why, why do people not know about this work and what, what can we do well, to get it, it out? Know, in fact, um, this stuff is incoming all day long for me. I'm, you know, I've got a great organization. Here's what we're doing. You've got to do a story on us. There's a lot of good work out there. And what I often say to rooms like this and to other people, the good work is a reward in itself, by the way. And you know, find other ways to do it. And what you now have available to you is that you don't need journalists anymore. You can create your own website. And you can find a way to use the world, the, 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 the environment of the of digital world to do it, the universe of the digital world, to spread the word about what you're doing. You're a physician, right? Perfect example. Look what's going on in your area. The sharing of the breakthroughs and the, and the new techniques that are being used and what hospitals are doing now. That doesn't require me to put you on the Today Show every morning or I'll put you on the evening news. You can create that for yourself. I'm going off, after 10 years, it breaks my heart, but I'm term limited off now. I'm going off the board of the Mayo Clinic. And um, it's been the most rewarding outside of my family and my job experience I've ever had. And when I got there, I was astonished at how little the Mayo Clinic was doing online and what they were doing in the digital environment. And we've gotten a lot better at it. We still have a long way to go. And it's in part because Insular institutions, uh, the hospitals and, and healthcare are really quite insular, as you know. They're, they're confined to where they are. This is a great opportunity, I think, for medicine to advance the understanding of its patient population by using all of these new techniques. But you don't need us to put you on the air every night to do that. Um, in fact, there's a kind of a limit that you can do on television because we only have so much time. <laughs> The New York Times does a pretty good job at it, and the specialty publications do as well. But I really think that the answer is online, is that creating the website, uh, have a consortium of hospitals or consortiums of disciplines that they go and they put that online, and then people can find out about it. I had a cancer called multiple myeloma, and it turns out that there was a woman who had survived it when she should not have. In 1998, people were dying from it. Um, and she fought her way through it. And then she created the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation. And it is a godsend, frankly, because what she does is collect all the best information about this cancer from all over the world. And it's become a clearinghouse for Italians and Spaniards and, and the Swiss who are doing work in this area and the domestic work that is being done as well. Well, if you've got the cancer, bang, I can go online and find out what Kathy's up to and what they're learning and, and then take that to my physicians, and it's not, just a, it's not just a Hail Mary from outer space. This is a very sophisticated site. That's the answer, and that's the kind of gear that we have to change in our minds about how we get attention for something. Uh, you know, that Warren Buffett is part of uh, uh, purpose-built communities because he saw you on television. That was a one-shot, and Julian Roberts as well, I think. So that does help. But as generations arise who are not looking at television anymore, by the way, they're really just going online. And uh, they're finding out all their information there. I can pretty well tell what the age demographic of this audience is. If I went into a room with people half your age, they wouldn't know who I am uh, because they don't watch television. You know, what they do is watch their small screens. Now, my grandchildren, I'm happy to say, do know who I am. <laughs> But here's the interesting thing, because they grew up seeing me only on television a lot of the time. They lived in different parts of the country. They call me Tom. <laughs> so I can be in a restaurant somewhere with my six-year-old, very bold New York granddaughter, and she'll say, Tom, what do we think tonight? We're going to have the sushi or the sashimi? <laughs> and it turns every head in the, in the restaurant. <laughs> Listen, I, I really do have to move on. I, I want to thank you all very much for this opportunity, but most of all, for your presence here and for your commitment to this great cause. And you really have to have almost something like Alcoholics Anonymous. If you get discouraged, you should be able to call each other and say, 
remind me again about why we're doing this <laughs> and how we have to do it. Thank you all very much.